Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. Um, I'm a really, really big Eurovision fan and I have been for the past 10 years. And as a UK citizen, naturally you'd think that I would gravitate towards supporting the UK every year. But actually as being partially of Maltese heritage, I'm always supporting Malta at Eurovision because they do way better every year. Despite being such a small country and not really having a, a huge music industry, they do much better than the UK every year. And for the past 10 years, I think I've just seen a huge decline in the quality of the UK's entries. So I um, thought I would chat about it today on my YouTube channel. So after another terrible, terrible year for the UK at Eurovision, and I mean terrible by last place, I've decided to make a video discussing the ways in which I believe the UK can improve its chances at the Eurovision Song Contest, particularly in next year's contest, and perhaps even in this approaching decade. Um, as a classically trained musician, I'm using my expertise and my experience to present some of my points regarding the more musical side of things. After all, it is a song contest, so I think my area of knowledge in terms of music and how the UK can improve might sort of provide a different angle to what m many other YouTubers might have put out already. Um, and feel free to write your comments down in the comment section, your ideas, um, what you think about the UK and Eurovision in the last 10-15 years. Um, I'm really interested to hear what you guys think and what you have to say and I'm excited to read your comments. So this is actually my main point and I believe that this point is underlying in the reason why the UK does so badly every year at Eurovision and that is the attitude of both the BBC and the British media and how their attitude impacts on the, the mood towards Eurovision in the UK and also the way that they conduct the search for artists, the way that the songs are written, everything. It has a knock-on effect on everything. So if this improves, then everything else will improve, if you get me, and our chances will increase in winning or coming at least top 10, which is something we haven't done for a long time. So I've been watching the song contest for 10 years now, and it's heartbreaking. It's, it's heartbreaking to see the contrast in attitudes between the Eurovision fans and the people that are responsible for the UK Act. In fact, there was some, this general consensus when we came last this year, the Brexit process, the whole thing that's going on with Brexit, is just totally responsible for the last place that we got. Um, and even our act, Michael Rice, I'm sure he's a nice person, he's very talented, but he had the audacity to blame Brexit for his placing in the contest. I mean, come on, it's a scapegoat to a subsequent Eurovision defeat. He couldn't just admit that maybe there was other reasons why the UK came last and not blame it all on Brexit. So given that Russia, a country that's arguably been the subject of mass controversy throughout the last decade, even longer than that, they have a brilliant track record at Eurovision. They've been consistently placing so high and putting quality acts out there and spending money on their productions. And it's safe to say that the politically motivated notion of Brexit being sort of the blame for the UK it has absolutely no leg to stand on. So the British media and BBC, you need to change your attitude. If you want to see success in the UK Eurovision acts, you need to change your attitude. So it's a widely known fact that the UK music industry has a global outreach. It has a global audience. Unlike some of the European counterparts in the competition of Eurovision, whose music industries are smaller and they have less of a reach. But why is it that they still do better than us in the ending results? Why do they place higher than us? The answer is, these countries are hiring top musicians and songwriters from their own countries and perhaps from external countries too. And these people work together to create a highly polished product to represent their own country. And 
Why is it that the UK can't do that? It's because they are not taking advantage of UK musical resources. They're finding in other countries really talented singer-songwriters, such as Duncan Lawrence, who actually won this year. And the BBC is not doing that. So what do they need to do? <laughs> they need to take advantage of the UK's musical resources. For instance, high quality singers and songwriters. Surely, surely the BBC has access to these people. They have to have access to these people. Where are they finding these other people from? They have these people's numbers. Come on, come on. So this year instead, we had an off-cut entry this year given to us from Sweden. So the BBC lazily entered this off-cut entry into their national selection process and it ended up winning. This song is called Bigger Than Us and it was actually written by John Lundvik who represented Sweden this year. So if the UK music industry has such an incredible global outreach etc etc, why are they graciously accepting a rejected entry from Sweden? It's sort of like they're a hungry pet dog under the dinner table just waiting for the scraps to fall. You have the resources, you have the talent, why are you not exploiting that? Why are you just letting other countries give you their reject songs? It's... it blows my mind. So my second point as to why the UK isn't doing so well at Eurovision and how it can improve is to do with the musical elements of the songs. So, watching this year's competition, it was so obvious that the UK's entry was going to struggle. Due to its place in the running order, it was next to Iceland and Norway. And these two songs did incredibly, incredibly well because of their authenticity, their wide appeal, their sort of difference, how they stood out in the competition. And sadly, these standout entries made the UK look even more embarrassingly middle of the road. It's kind of as if the producers of the show used it as a like a toilet break filler in between these two interesting songs. And actually, one of these songs, Norway, went on to win the televote. I mean, come on, the UK had an absolutely no chance with this. So BBC Radio 4 had a programme called More or Less, and that actually touched upon a few interesting musical elements, which I completely agreed with. These musical elements actually prove why the UK was gonna flop like crazy. Firstly, it pointed out that more winning songs throughout the 2010s decade were composed in the minor key and in music the minor key gives a song more melancholic or edgy qualities, sort of broadly speaking, but the UK has consistently entered songs in the major key which does the opposite of what a minor key does and that is it kind of gives it a more optimistic quality but usually it, it just enhances the crass elements of a song and the results have consistently been appalling. But there was one instance a few years ago, 2017, when Lucy Jones' song Never Give Up On You was entered into the competition and that song was actually in a minor key and that came 15th which is a result which compared to the UK's track record is actually pretty pretty decent. So another thing we need to do is to stay away from dramatic key changes and I think you know what I mean by dramatic key changes, the truck driver's gear change which usually falls at the last chorus at the end of the song. This technique is so ancient, it's outdated, it's crass, it makes the song more cruise ship, it cheapens the act completely. We just need to drop this, this whole technique at the end of a song. No one uses it in the UK charts, so it shouldn't really be used on the Eurovision stage. Furthermore, we need songs that ooze quality and ooze musicianship. Bigger Than Us is a song that does the exact opposite of those two words, quality and musicianship. It's a perfect example of an outdated and lazy composition. In the three minute duration, it uses four chords repeated. Talk about boring. Talk about lazy. Melodically, the vocal line doesn't move around very much. It sort of sits around a comfortable and tight range. There's no show-stopping moments of any sort. In short, it's boring. What we need 
in our UK acts are more daring explorations of harmony and melody in compositions, more light and shade within the music. I mean, look at Duncan Lawrence's Arcade. This was a song that explores different time signatures in music. It makes it more interesting. There's sort of unstable rhythms, and that was there to reflect the instability of the text. Now that is musicianship. That's composition. That's that's quality. That's bigger than us. Didn't have any of that. It didn't have any substance. They didn't have any style. It was just bland. It was like a salad with no dressing. That's how I see it. So I think. All in all, by exploiting the huge choice of quality songwriters and quality musicians, of course, I think we'll be able to achieve something, the level of, of the Netherlands, the levels of, of Italy, of Russia this year. Not last place. So if the attitude of the BBC and the UK media can improve, it's going to encourage a flow of familiar faces from the UK music scene into the competition they're going to start to take an interest. After all, if you enter in the Eurovision Song Contest, you have such a massive exposure to a huge, huge audience, 300 million people across the continent. That's incredible. And that has an ability to boost your career. Now, I'm not one of those people that really wants Adele or Elton John or Ed Sheeran. I don't want them to enter the competition. What I'd like to see are familiar faces, medium-sized names, up-and-coming artists, established acts like Georgia Smith, Nina Nesbitt, Freya Ridings, the 1975, people like that to be entering Eurovision. And we know these people are extremely talented and they put on an amazing live performance. They're trustworthy musicians. So if the music in Eurovision has become consistently more chart-friendly, pop music, the quality has increased in the last 20 years, then surely these people should become attracted to the competition because it's not crass, it's not juvenile, it's not a sort of novelty act anymore. Not all of it, it's becoming more serious. And if Loreen in 2012 with the winning song Euphoria can chart at number three in the UK charts, then surely that should be a major factor in sort of up and coming established acts in the UK wanting to enter the competition. I mean, it's a brilliant platform. Another thing the UK needs is music that actually represents the UK music scene. We can all agree that Bigger Than Us by Michael Rice is not representative of the top 40 in the UK. It would never ever be played on Radio 1. Would you expect it on Radio 1? No. The BBC needs to be creating a package that really gives us a good representation of what UK music, authentic UK music, sounds like. I mean, other countries are doing it. We really, really need to step off this middle-of-the-road bandwagon and opt for a wider choice of genres, languages and styles. That's all we need. Examples could be, I don't know, folk, grime, UK garage, musical theatre, jazz, there's so many options. I mean, for instance, in 2009, the UK came fifth. That's brilliant. And that song was penned by Andrew Lloyd Webber, who was a top English songwriter, incredibly famous in the musical theatre scene. You can hear the difference in quality between 2009's entry and 2019's entry. Just listen to it for yourself. So the final point I want to come to, and this isn't necessarily to do with the music, but it's to do with the importance of the music video and social media platforms and YouTube. The popularity of Eurovision songs has really been greatly aided by YouTube in the last few years. It's clear to see that some countries are making such a massive effort with their concept and the productions of the songs in their company music videos. Arcade was elevated further through its emotive music video and it went viral. It's so obvious that countries are increasing their budgets in this area to really pack a punch. So the UK music video for this year, however, was representative of their budget, not in the best way, let me just say. So the music video for Bigger Than Us, which I watched this year, left very little impression on me. In fact, the only thing I can really remember about it is its really terrible camera work and overall cheap quality. The sort of, the, the visual, the look of it, the visuals was so cheap. 
I'm not really an expert in this field, to be, to be frank. I'm not an expert in this field. I mean, just look at the Maltese entry compared to the UK. Their colourful, fun music video for that song called Chameleon. Compared to the UK, it just, it's just an embarrassment. The lack of effort and money, it translates to the Eurovision stage as well as music video. I mean, that lacklustre, unmemorable performance was so embarrassing to sit there and want to support the UK and then that's what they give you. Considering the quality of the television dramas that the BBC produces on a regular basis, which you can access on the iPlayer or whatever, considering that, I'm sure they have more than like, I don't know, a £200 Nikon Coolpix camera to lend to the Eurovision production team. Come on, come on. So overall, it's just, it's so incredibly sad to see what the UK and Eurovision has come to be. The BBC really needs to wake up and smell the roses, to be honest, because if we're investing so much money in the competition itself, go straight to the final, be part of the big five, but we're not investing any money in the acts themselves. That's a huge problem. I mean, it's not exactly the acts themselves that are the problem. No disrespect to them, they're all very talented people. It's the material they're given to work with. So if the BBC and the media can change their attitude towards Eurovision, enlist top quality songwriters and musicians to help in the process of writing a song and producing the music video, etc, etc. And also, we have such a diverse range of genres in the UK. Represent our country. Represent what our charts are like instead of accepting rejects from Sweden and other countries, then I think we might actually have a chance to do well. Thank you so much for watching my video. Please leave a comment down below, like or subscribe if you want to see more content. And thank you, I hope you enjoyed it. And please tell me what you think and what your opinions are on this subject, as it's probably, I feel like a lot of YouTubers are going to start making videos about this now. So yeah, thank you very much.